I had such a great, amazing time working on this film. I love everyone that worked on it. It's such a great group of people. And then on top of that, you know, with the award stuff, it's just like, it's crazy. It's it's really cool to be told that you did a good job where you got to work on a movie where you loved your job. That's Jennifer Lame. And if you don't recognize her voice, you'd certainly recognize her work. She's the film editor behind some of Hollywood's biggest movies of the last decade. Lame made a name for herself editing Noah Baumbach's Francis Ha, a film I absolutely love, and catapulted to excellence as the editor on Ryan Coogler's Black Panther Wakanda Forever, Ari Aster's Hereditary, and Christopher Nolan's Tenet. Directors usually get most of the credit in Hollywood, but film editors are often the ones responsible for making a movie what it is. And Jennifer Lame is at the top of an elite list of female editors who are shaping Hollywood from behind the scenes. Now, as the editor of Oppenheimer, her latest collaboration with Christopher Nolan, Lame has earned her first ever Oscar nomination for film editing. It's one of Oppenheimer's 13 Oscar nods, making it the most nominated film of the year. She's also won a Critics' Choice Award and a BAFTA for her work on Oppenheimer. And in our conversation, she talks about what film editors see that others don't, how she relates to visionary directors, and our shared love of 1990s video stores. I'm Charlotte Alter, senior correspondent for Time, and this is Person of the Week. So I want to go sort of back in time uh, to when you were a kid, because frankly, I'm really interested in how you got into this sector of the industry. So can you remember the first film that left a real lasting impression on you? And what was it? I went through a big Hitchcock phase as a really young kid and not because I'm like super interesting or precocious. It's because there was this video store called West Coast Video, which is funny because I lived in the suburbs of Philadelphia. I remember West Coast Video, you too. You do? And I lived in New Jersey. Oh, my God, right? And it had, like, the stars and the red boxes, and it was so exciting. Anyway, they had a section that they curated by directors, so I would just kind of, like, wander around there and just, like, devour random things, and I got really into the Hitchcock ones. And um, I did kind of the big ones first, you know, like mm-hmm. Notorious, Vertigo, The Man Who Knew Too Much, and all those. But then I remember I picked up Shadow of a Doubt, and... It was just so strange and interesting, and it just left this crazy impression on me of seeing a director that felt kind of like mainstream. It was a director my parents knew, but then he obviously took these big risks and made this bizarre movie that I really loved, and it was like looking around when I was watching it, like, this is so weird. Like, how did he do this? And um, yeah, I just think that left a big impression on me and made me feel like movies were this exciting place to do kind of crazy and weird things. So tell me more about this video store. Like, did you have a systematic approach to going through all of these different directors? How did you approach going to the store? Yeah, I think, you know, I would just get to go there on the weekends. Like, you know, my parents would take me and um, at first I would just pick random movies and then you start getting sick of the regular movies. And that's when I kind of meandered into that weird section of just like curated by directors. And I got really into um, John Carpenter movies for a while. Like it was so fun with the video stores because you didn't have that anxiety that I have. I don't know if you have it today of when you turn on any of the platforms like Netflix or Hulu or all those things, I get exhaustion just thinking about what to pick that I end up not picking anything. <laughs> and yes, that's me about me like, too. yeah. Your parents drop you off at the video store. You have 10 minutes to pick and then you're leaving and they don't care and you just have to run around and you kind of just, you know what I mean? Like, that's it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't pick something, you don't watch a movie that night. So, yeah, I just found it thrilling and you have to trust other people. And I was growing up in kind of a place where I felt like a little bit of maybe an outsider and there was something about that video store that I felt like they were my friends recommending things, even though they weren't Hmm. (laughs) because I didn't really have friends that were like movie nerds as much as I was. So um, it was just kind of this like nerdy little place I could go and feel like I had fake movie friends. (laughs) Um, It's so funny to hear you say this about the video store because I have this like distinctive memory. For us, it was Blockbuster, but like we were only allowed to watch a movie on Friday night and on Saturday night. So two movies per weekend. 
and there were three kids in my family. And my parents would drop us off at the video store. And just like you said, you had like 10 or 15 minutes to pick out a video. And it was like battle royale, (laughs) alliances. And my brother wants to watch basketball for the 90th (laughs) time. And he's trying to get me or my sister to like align with him. My sister's like, no, I want to watch Beethoven. Oh, so good. Yeah. Just... It's like a core memory. That is so cute. Anyway, so you ended up going to Wesleyan. Did you realize at the time that you went to college that you wanted to work in film or that you wanted to be an editor? How did you come to that? I didn't go to like the most creative high school. So I think I picked Wesleyan. I had visited a couple schools, but I liked that Wesleyan was like super liberal arts, kind of weird, you know. Um, And I knew they had a film program, but it was quite difficult to get into. But I I wasn't like positive I wanted to do film. Um, I was really into history and English, too. But I liked that the film department was like history based, right? A lot of what Wesleyan's film department is about is like watching movies, screening them on film. They have a great film preservation collection and writing about them and thinking about them and talking about them. So I read that your thesis was actually a documentary. So what did you learn from working in documentary that you then brought into your film work? I got very invested in the editing of my documentary. I think documentary editing is incredibly difficult, and I admire the people that do it. And I actually thought that I wanted to edit documentaries based on doing it in college. But I became obsessed with editing this kind of 10 or 12-minute documentary I'd shot. And I think I just became kind of enamored by the editing process by way of doing that documentary. Mm -hmm. But I think I like working with writer directors and I like working on really complex kind of big complicated movies and I think you know having been in love with and come from that documentary world I think that just lended itself to the types of movies I was attracted to but Mm. I think just working on that documentary was really just kind of where I fell in love with editing. So how did you get your first big break into the film world? I would say I had two big breaks. My first big break was um, right after Wesley and I moved to L.A. And I had a really hard time breaking into Hollywood, you know, just getting on a movie or a TV show or anything. And so I ended up editing commercials from stock footage for a startup company, um, hmm. which was actually kind of interesting. And I met some great people, but I really wanted to work in movies. And um, a friend of mine's sister named Jennifer Lilly, she had worked in Woody Allen's cutting rooms. She was an assistant editor and her brother was my friend. And I'd always asked her brother, you know, if she ever needs any help, let me know. And one day on a Friday, she called me and she was like, I actually need an apprentice editor. My apprentice editor quit. If you come to New York, I'll get you into the union. And I quit my job, packed my bags and just went to New York. Wow. Because I was so young, you know, I just gave my apartment to a friend of mine. Like, I literally just left. Yeah, it was intense. But she got me to the union, and it was the Sidney Lumet movie called Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. So my first film job was with Sidney Lumet, which is incredible. Wow. And it was an amazing job, and she kind of became a mentor to me. And then I, you know, did a lot of assistant editing on TV shows and movies for a while, and then I eventually got another big break when... um an editor named Michael Taylor recommended me to another editor named Tim Strito, who was working for Noah Baumbach, and he needed an assistant who could cut because it was a super low budget movie called Francis Ha. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then luckily Noah and I really got along. And it was one of those things like I was in the right place at the right time. And I also just made sure I was an expert on the film. So I was invaluable and they didn't get rid of me. Right. I was just like working my butt off to make sure that that didn't happen. And luckily it didn't. So yeah. And then I ended up doing, I think, five movies with Noah. I mean, we just got along fantastically. And what a great first film. I love that movie so much. Um, it it's was, one of my favorite movies. I love Francis Hopkins. It was very personal to me at the time because one of my best friends was dating this guy that I hated and we were like attached at the hip. So I was kind of devastated. And obviously that's a big part of the movie. And I just felt really lost in my life. I was like, am I ever going to be an editor? What am I going to do? You know, so it was just like such an amazing first film because I felt so deeply connected to the material. Hmm. Yeah. So I would say those are kind of the two kind of amazing breaks that I got. So tell me more about editing Francis Ha. Like, what did you learn from that experience? Uh, I learned so many things. I mean, I learned to work with a director and also a director that I was incredibly intimidated by because I was a huge fan of his, which I could never really let Mm -hmm. on because you don't want to make them uncomfortable. But I mean, I love Squid and the Whale and Greenberg and Margot at the Wedding, I think is fantastic. And editing wise, I think it's incredibly experimental and interesting. So um, Noah Baumbach, you know, I was I looked up to him immensely. So to have to sit in a room and kind of give him my opinions was quite intimidating. So kind of learning how to navigate that relationship 
was a huge learning curve for me. And um, yeah, learning to have like a voice and have an opinion and just also be creative and experimental because Noah actually really loves editing and he encouraged me to try a bunch of things. And um, I just learned so much on that job. It was, it was Hmm. incredible. Yeah. Can you help our listeners understand, you know, what is the difference between a director's vision and an editor's vision? You know, what is an editor seeing that a director isn't seeing? Or what is an editor going for that a director isn't going for? I think it's less about like that they're not seeing it. And I think a director's job is one of the hardest jobs, obviously, in my industry. You have so much in your brain. You're dealing with so much. You're making thousands of decisions a day. So I think an editor's job is to keep your focus on the performances and the story kind of during the shoot, you know, like oftentimes, for example, when I would work with Noah, he would call me kind of midday and at the end of the day and just talk through like, do you feel like we're getting the right performances for the character? Because I'm keeping track of the character, right? Like he's keeping Mm -hmm. track of that along with a thousand other decisions. And that's all I'm keeping track of is, are we getting the performance to have this through line for this character? Are we getting these performances? Do we need another take? Do we need a different reading? Mm. So just really my focus is the performances, the story, are things cutting together rhythmically? Does it feel right? You know, all that stuff that a director obviously is paying attention to, but he can't focus just on that. Like I'm that part of their brain kind of and kind of let them know what's going on. And then once we're in the edit room, I'm just that collaborator to help continue that trajectory of finishing the movie and making the movie the best version it can be once it's been shot. Because obviously there's deviations from the script or things you thought would turn out didn't. And just putting the whole thing together, it's kind of like writing a book, like an author of a book doesn't want to edit their own book. Like you need that person to kind of have that struggle with and relationship with and a person who you vibe with that can be honest with you and that can work through problems and sit in a room with other people. And then afterwards you talk through what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you think is the key to a successful collaboration? You were just mentioning that so much of your work is about collaborating with the director. What are some of the things that you've learned about collaboration in your years of doing this work? I think for me, it's really about learning the personality and getting to know how a director likes to work and how I can be the most useful to them. Because oftentimes it's quite different from director Hmm. to director. And I think really taking a minute and listening and observing and just really understanding what is needed rather than kind of just interjecting your style because that doesn't really work and that's not going to help anybody. Like when I would work with Noah, he would send me super early drafts of the script and we would talk about stuff really early on. And, you know, with someone like Chris, that's not how he works at all, you know, but he works very Hmm. different when we're editing together than when I did with Noah. So I think it's just about establishing that relationship. And it's it's a very complicated, intense relationship. So I find as I get older, I, I don't really want to start new relationships with directors. Like I just interviewed a, like a year or two ago with the director and I kind of made a joke where I was like, I don't want to meet new people. And he laughed too. And he's like, me neither. Yeah. Because it's, it's a really intense relationship, the director, editor. And like in a dream world, you kind of just have two or three Because, you know, when I did Tenet with Chris, I remember by the end of it, I finally was like, okay, I hope I get to do another one because now I really get it. But it took like a whole movie to really kind of understand like how this person works, right? Yeah. And it was exhausting and um, stressful to learn all that. And so I was like, I hope I get to use these skills and apply it to another movie. Right. So speaking of Christopher Nolan, um, what is the difference between working on a Noah Baumbach film and working on a Christopher Nolan film? Oh, God, that's a tough question. I think the difference is their personalities and how they like to work. But both of them are similar in that they both love the editing process. And um, they're both writer-directors. And I've mostly worked with writer-directors. So in that regard, kind of editing with those types of filmmakers is quite intensive, but I find very fulfilling. Hmm. Because it's their work, right? They're, it's very personal to them. But so I feel like when you change things or when you're talking about the film, it's quite personal, which I love because I feel like everything is kind of heightened, right? There's stakes to everything in a way that is a little bit different. The one or two times I've worked with kind of directors that haven't written the material, there's a little bit of a distance there. But I think one of the differences with Noah, because of the way we worked on Francis Ha and Mistress America, and there were these low budget, really fun projects that we did together. Mm. And it was really, we were all kind of in it together. 
And I think because we started that way and then progressed onto bigger and more traditional movies, we kind of always kept that vibe that we had on Francis and Mistress America, where we were really all just like in it together and constantly mm-hmm. talking. And I feel like with Chris, because I came on kind of later for him, you know, I've only done two movies with him. It's quite different. And he also, he operates in a much different way. You know, I read his scripts right before he starts shooting and we talk about it, but they're very tight at that point. There's not much to edit at that point. And then when he's in the edit, he's in the edit. He's very invested. And then every other director I've worked with has been different than both those guys. Mm-hmm. So they all kind of have a different way of working. Um, so many Noah Baumbach movies feature a lot of dialogue and specifically arguments. I'm thinking most famously of that big fight in Marriage Story, which you also edited. In your experience, what makes a good fight scene? Mm. God, I love a fight scene. I think relatability. Like when I saw that fight scene in Anatomy of a Fall, like that's a fight I could completely relate to in my husband as well, which he admitted. So I think just it feeling relatable and real and messy and emotional and has to have the highs and the lows and the moments like, you know, a roller coaster. Like I feel like that marriage story fight, you know, it has moments where it's maybe almost you want to laugh and then you want to cry and then um, you want to hide your face. So I think it has to be a real kind of ride, which is how all fights feel in real life. But it is hard to create that on film because it can very quickly feel unnatural or a bit forced or a bit just actory, you know? Hmm. When we come back, film editor Jennifer Lame talks about getting nominated for her first Oscar for her work on Oppenheimer. More in a moment. So... Tell me about Oppenheimer. Um, How did you get approached about Oppenheimer? And what were you thinking as you sort of started to work on this film? Um, I think I had lunch with Chris and he kind of said he was working on something, but he wasn't sure yet. And then I had signed on to Wakanda Forever with Ryan Coogler. And then I did get a call from Chris and he was like, hey, come over to the house. I have this project for you. And so I read the script right before shooting. But then I wasn't able to come on until after the shoot because I was on Wakanda forever. So all that complicatedness to say that I missed the shoot of Oppenheimer, but because Chris and I had done a film together previously, he was okay with that. So I came on the day they wrapped filming, which isn't typical for an editor. Usually you're on the whole shoot. So yeah, that was scary because most editors don't like doing that because if you just think about it on a basic level, you're just behind, right? I'm behind. I have to do the whole movie and they already shot it. But it ended up being okay. Chris just gave me four weeks, I think. And he said, you know, watch all the footage, try to cut as much as you can, but don't stress. And I think taking that pressure off of that assembly that you're supposed to have at the end of a shoot, I actually found it kind of freeing and it allowed me to just play around and just watch all the footage. And then I naturally kind of did just cut an assembly. So how did you approach pacing this film? Because Oppenheimer is three hours long. (laughs) How do you know when pacing is working? Do you have a strategy for that? I don't have a strategy. I think pacing is a hard thing for me to talk about because it's kind of like, for me, for an editor, pacing is everything, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like my whole job in a way is pacing. So um, I think for me, pacing-wise, this film, I thought of it just kind of in these increments. And I kind of just kept going back to when I read the script and how the script made me feel these like ups and downs because I like ripped through that script when I read it. I couldn't wait to get to the end, which is not a typical thing because reading scripts can be quite painful most of the time. But Mm -hmm. that script in particular, I found thrilling. And to go back to the beginning, like I love history. I love uh, drama. The, The script has everything in it for me, aside from just being brilliant and just being about this incredible moment in history. So I think pacing wise, I just would keep referring back to the script and that initial hit that I got and want to make sure that I emulated that in my editing of the film, right? So I could recreate that feeling I had. And pacing is so much a feeling and a feeling of having screenings and a feeling of screening it just Chris and I and 
it's something that I've been doing for so long in terms of just editing the film that I feel like I have an intuitive kind of like musical idea of what I want. And then, of course, I watch it most of the time and it's bad, which is why editing takes a while. And so, yeah, it's just a constant. You think it's good and then it's not, but it's a relief when you know it's not, right? And then you can fix yeah. it. So I want to ask you about the, you know, what I consider to be the climax of Oppenheimer, which is this Trinity test scene where all the scientists of the Manhattan Project come together and they test the first atomic bomb. Uh, it's this obviously this huge historical moment. Can you tell us anything about some of the decision-making that went into the editing of that scene? Yeah, I think um, that scene, they shot a lot of extra stuff because the production designer had done a lot of great research and put together a lot of stuff. So there was a lot more footage than was in the script. So so building up to that, um, we really got to be creative and like really build that kind of anxiety and, and playing a lot of it on the faces of these young scientists who are just, you know, so nervous and have the weight of the world on them just trying to get this going. And then the bomb actually going off, I think we've all seen images of the bomb. We all know what the bomb looks like. But I think just being in screenings when it actually goes off and hearing people kind of gasp, I think that's what our goal was, right? To get the gas leading right. up to that. There's no way to make it more horrifying than we can all imagine, right? Our goal was to get the gas leading up to it and then kind of make it poetic and interesting and about Oppenheimer and about the scientists and their reactions to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was it like to hear that you were nominated for an Oscar? Oh, man. It was crazy. I actually purposely slept through that whole announcement thing that morning because I, I think leading up to it, you're just like, God, I really, it would be so amazing to get nominated for an Oscar. And then when it gets close to it, you're like, I don't even want to mm -hmm. know. You don't even really want to deal with it or there's so many mixed emotions with it. So I think I just slept through and tried to like get through my morning. I woke up around like 7 a.m. I knew it was that morning and I tried to not look at my phone and woke up with my two-year-old and went downstairs and saw my husband in the kitchen. He's like, you know, you got nominated for an Oscar. Right? And I was like, wow, what? Um, and of course I ran upstairs and like grabbed my phone, but I really just like tried not to focus on it because the whole thing just felt so, it's just so overwhelming, right? It's like, you can't even imagine it. Yeah. But then when he said that, I of course was like, what? And I let it sink in. Like that day, I remember I had like a sinus infection. I was going to look for a neti pot and I kept having to stop and being like, you got nominated for an Oscar today <laughs> and had to like, <laughs> like take a minute for myself. But yeah, it's just, it's so strange. It's so strange, you know? The other thing that's really hard about all this that I like, want, I just have to say a lot is like, I worked on Oppenheimer almost two years ago. Oh, wow. So whenever people ask me about things, specific things, like I really have to like go back there in my mind like working on movies is like having a baby. It's like, I forget everything, right? Because it's so intense. Like, I don't know if you have kids, but if someone's like, how did you deal with sleep training? I'm like, I don't remember. But at the time, it's like the most important thing in my life. Oh, totally. <laughs> I have a two-year-old. I'm about to have another one. Oh my God, congratulations. Yeah. Does your two-year-old know that you were nominated no, for an Oscar? No, he has no, no idea. I have a six-year-old who knows he's heard Oppenheimer because, you know, I, I've had to go away. And when I'm working, he's heard the word yeah. Oppenheimer. And I, I think at like a coffee shop one time, he saw like a bus drive by or like a poster. And he's like, my mom did Oppenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> he just like blurted that out. I was like, what are you talking about? So um, they like kind of know I worked on a film and I think they I've tried to explain editing to them. But uh, yeah, they really have no idea. <laughs> so one thing I kind of wanted to ask you about is this question of like credit and ownership, because a lot of times there are these really incredible films that are made. And typically it's like, the director and the movie stars who get all the credit for that. And I'm thinking about your kid saying to you, my mom did Oppenheimer. <laughs> um, do you feel like editors get their due in terms of the recognition for the work that they do to make the movies that people really care about? I think all creative heads of department on movies and also the crew and the gaffers and the costume department and, you know, the P like. I feel like everyone probably does feel like they would like more credit than they get at times like these when it does have to be a lot about the stars and the directors and stuff like that. But I actually do feel like I've been lucky enough to work with directors that are super supportive of what I do and what everyone on their film sets do. 
And I do feel sad when I do notice a film or a project where I do think an editor did a great job or production designer or somebody that nobody talks about. On the other hand, the director is, it is his movie, you know, it's their baby. Like, you know, mm-hmm. they wrote it, they directed, they poured everything into it. And it's an incredibly difficult job. And I do a tiny, tiny part of it that I do think is quite important. But um, it's that weird balance, right? Right. Is there a director, living or dead, that you always wanted to work with? I think a director who has actually, ha- I'm halfway through his uh, biography is Mike Nichols, who I love. I oh, mean, yeah. he has so many. What I love about his movies is um, just like the range, you know, like The Graduate, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and then Working Girl, which is one of my favorite mm-hmm. movies. And it's what a great movie that I feel like would get made today, which is just like a huge movie, but also funny and a romantic comedy, but also a great film. Um, yeah. Yeah. He's just incredible. So I totally agree with you. There seems like there is something, there is a sense of, like, they don't make movies like they used to make them anymore. Yeah. And part of that is, like, the way the industry has turned. Um, Part of it is, like, movies seem really intense now. They're, like, really emotionally intense. They're often very psychological. How do you think movie making has changed since, for example, the Mike Nichols era? That is such a good question. I'm actually reading the book right now, so you'd think I would have a good answer. Um, I don't know. It's weird. It's like just reading that book, it's like it felt like back then people took bigger risks. It's funny that people took such big risks back then and they don't today because um, like there's so many different platforms to put everything on. You think you'd see more experimentation with that regard. And obviously there's the digital error. So it's it's like, you know, with digital movies, People think it's easier to make movies. And obviously, we live in a world where someone can pick up anything and shoot a movie, but the experimentation isn't happening as much as it does. And so I don't know. Maybe it's a risk. Maybe it's who's running the film studios. I don't know. I have no idea. But yeah, it does feel like things are all a bit (laughs) same-same. So my very last question for you is, do you have an editing routine or a sort of a thing that you do to get in the zone? Anything that you kind of use to get you sort of into your editing mind space? You know what? I don't really, and I probably should, but I think like by not having that is what I do is I try to kind of like delay it a little bit. So I'll like go to work and I'll like chat with my coworkers or like, oh, yeah. mine is like avoidance is my routine. And procrastination. By procrastination. And by procrastinating, I usually, um, fun comes out of it. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh God, I got to go to work. And then I just, uh, like, you know, get to work. But I think that's kind of my vibe is like just um, connecting with everyone and trying to be a little bit social and have a little bit of fun before I sit down alone in a room for many hours by myself. Yeah. We journalists call that thinking. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And you're right. And I think if I didn't do that and I had some other weird thing where I just like sat down with my coffee and got to work, I'd probably wouldn't be as creative. (laughs) I'm going to call it thinking. Of course not. Of course not. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's called contemplation. Okay, good. Thank you. Because I clearly feel guilty about it, but it's clearly important. Oh, it's the cult of productivity getting to you. Don't let them win. (laughs) Jennifer, it's been so great talking to you about Oppenheimer and your work in film. But now we want to take a second to get to know more about you in a segment that we like to call The Last Time. So... When is the last time you ate your favorite movie theater snack? Oh, the last time I ate my favorite movie theater snack. I haven't been to the movie theater in a long time. It's okay. What is your favorite movie theater snack? Like really buttery popcorn. And I'm trying to think the last time I ate that. It's so good. It's so good. There's nothing as good as movie theater popcorn. Okay. When's the last time you put together a blooper reel? Uh, Wakanda Forever. I did like a funny blooper reel for Ryan Coogler. Nice. Uh, when's the last time you took your son to the playground? Oh, my gosh. Um, like a week ago. We live five minutes from a playground. I usually go every weekend. When's the last time you read a script you were excited about? Recently, probably a month ago. And when's the last time you used TikTok? I don't use TikTok, but my husband does. So the last time is probably like a week ago when I peeked over his shoulder and wanted to see something funny. <laughs> <laughs> when's the last time you used iMovie? I've never used iMovie. 
Wow. I know. I'm like one of, I I feel like most of my friends edit all of their kids' magical videos and I don't. And it's crazy. And I feel like a failure. (laughs) If it makes you feel any better, I don't edit any of my kids' videos either. And they're all just like sitting there. I know. Sitting there. Um, I really appreciate you making time to speak with us. Thank you so, so much. Um, I've learned so much from you and it's, it's just really great to hear about your career and all the incredible movies that you made. So thank you. Thank you. And this has been so fun. Thank you for having me. Jennifer Lame is nominated for an Academy Award for Best Film Editing for her work on Oppenheimer. And you can see if Oppenheimer ends up winning all 13 of its nominations, including for Best Picture and Best Director, at the Oscars this Sunday. Thank you so much for listening to Person of the Week. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, we'd love to hear from you. So send your tips or thoughts on our show to personoftheweek at time.com. I'm Charlotte Alter. See you next week. Person of the Week is hosted by Charlotte Alter. It's produced by Nina Bisbano and Allison Bailey. Our senior producer is Ursula Summer. Our story editor is Katie Feather. This episode was mixed by Cedric Wilson. Our theme music was composed by Billy Libby. Joseph Frischmuth is our fact checker. Person of the Week is a co-production of Time Studios and Sugar 23. At Time, our executive producers are Dave O'Connor, Michael Erlinger, and Sam Jacobs. At Sugar 23, our executive producers are Mike Mayer, Michael Sugar, and Liam Billingham. Sasha Mathias is the head of audio at Time. You can find us online at time.com slash person of the week and wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>